Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. On behalf of City Lights booksellers and publishers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatusha Loni peoples, from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the fall season and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. Tonight, we are thrilled to be celebrating the launch of a remarkable new book. It is titled Bay Lexicon, a field guide to San Francisco's shoreline. It is published by McGill Queens University Press. Our event is being co-sponsored by the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. It is a wonderful educational resource located at the city's waterfront. We'll be posting links in the chat function for you to learn more about them. If you haven't visited them, uh, please do. And if you have, visit them again. They've got some amazing exhibits and uh, it's really some great stuff happening there. Uh, so we are delighted to have with us tonight the author of Bay Lexicon, Jane Wolf. Jane Wolf is an associate professor at the University of Toronto's Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. With a background in landscape architecture and documentary filmmaking, she is also an activist whose scholarship articulates terms for the very complex landscapes of the Anthropocene. Her work uses writing and drawing to decipher and represent the web of relationships, processes, and stories that shape everyday landscapes. Her current research concerns the metropolitan landscapes of Toronto. Her previous publications include Delta Primer, A Field Guide to the California Delta, the web resource Gutter to Gulf. This was co-authored with Elise Shelley and Derek Hofferlin, as well as Landscape Citizenships, edited together with Tim Waterman and Ed Wall. The Bay Lexicon has connections to an exhibit with the same name developed by Jane Wolf and located in the Fisher Bay Observatory Gallery at the Exploratorium, located here in San Francisco along the Embarcadero waterfront, as mentioned earlier. So it seems natural that the interlocutor for tonight's event would be none other than Susan Schwarzenberg. Susan Schwarzenberg is the senior artist at the Exploratorium, where she leads the development of the Fisher Bay Observatory Gallery. She has been a curator, photographer, designer, and artist, and served as director of media for the museum. She has participated in many exhibit developments and web-based projects. Ms. Schwarzenberg was also a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and has taught at the San Francisco Art Institute, the uh, California College of Art, and Stanford University. As a photographer and visual artist, she has received numerous awards and has taken part in residencies and exhibitions worldwide. She is known for her public art and including recent works at Stanford University and San Francisco's McLaren Park. Such a great pleasure to have you both gracing our virtual halls. Jane Wolf, Susan Schwarzenberg, welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, and thank you so much for the land acknowledgement. We, uh, Jane and I, were both going to start with a land acknowledgement from our two respective locations. So Jane, why don't you uh, give your acknowledgement from Toronto? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm joining you from Toronto and I wanna acknowledge that this place where I'm speaking from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and it's still home to many members of um, men, uh, members of many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and um, Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and um, here when we offer these land acknowledgements, um, we also ask the people we're with to take a moment to think about the places where they are, where you are. Uh, and to think about the places that you love, where you're from, uh, and, and, and reflect on the history of those lands. So thank you. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be with you, um, even in this strange, flat <laughs> world of my monitor. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I also want to take a moment just to thank City Lights for, for inviting us since uh, the Exploratorium moved to the waterfront uh, on Piers 15 and 17. We've been talking to uh, Peter and Elaine about doing something together, and this is the project that uh, finally came to fruition. I think they've 
done other things with other parts of our museum, but um, but as I was thinking about it, I realized that we actually collaborated 40 years ago on a project uh, on poetry and science with our former, our first director, founding director, Frank Oppenheimer, and I'm sure Lawrence Ferlinghetti was involved. And it was a, a series of readings and discussions around how important language is to understanding science, uh, for poetry, for creative writing, how we put into words and phrases what we're thinking, what we mean, what we believe in is really essential. And so tonight it's wonderful that this, you know, 40 years later, our next collaboration is about language. Uh, again, it's about how important that we can put into words and phrases what we know about the world around us. So with that, I'd like to really, uh, we, Jane and I have been working together since about 2007, uh, too long to remember. I, if we seem a little disjointed as we're so used to talking to each other, it was a little hard for me to put my things I say to her into questions. <laughs> so, uh, so bear with us. But the first uh, thing I wanted her to, to really talk about is what is Bay Lexicon? What is it? Where did, how did it come about and what is it exactly? <laughs> well, it's a book and um, it's a book about different things. It's a book about a walk um, and a walk along the shoreline of San Francisco and about the vocabulary uh, that emerges from that walk. Um, and it's also about the need for, a, for that sort of vocabulary, a vocabulary tied to place and a vocabulary that we can share as we think about the future um, because um, we're looking at huge change, like it or not, from the climate emergency. And I think one big obstacle to any kind of progress on our collective action is the absence of language that's adequate to the complexity of the circumstances we find ourselves in. So the book is more than just a series of definitions. It's visual, um, it poses questions. Can you kind of take us through a little bit, you've already told us where the walk is, but how does one use a book to take a walk? What, how, how do you do that? <laughs> Good question. So I'm gonna share my screen and we did a test, it worked. So let's hope it works again. Um, hold on one second. Oops. I'm the host now, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, great. So, yeah, good. Okay, so it's a walk along San Francisco's shoreline with the bay from um, Fort Point at the Presidio along the Northern shore, um, which you're seeing. And this gets you to, for San Franciscans, to Market Street. Um, and then the second half of the walk goes from Market Street down to uh, Hunter's Point. And you can see that this map is also a question. And the question is something that seems really quite straightforward, but actually it isn't. The question is, where is the edge of the bay? So all the red dots you're seeing along that line mark field entries like the entries in any kind of field guide that explain what you see when you're there and help you understand the patterns and the processes um, that you're identifying. And Susan and I thought it would be nice to show a few of those field entries that speak directly to this apparently simple, deceptively simple question, where is the edge of the bay? Uh, so the first one uh, is right under the Bay Bridge, uh, and it's a drawing of something you could see with your eyes, a person standing under the bridge and looking at that shadow over the Embarcadero. And um, I'll read you a little bit of the field entry, um, which is a, um, a partial answer, a possible answer to the question, where does the bridge uh, cast a shadow? The Bay Bridge casts a shadow on the Embarcadero. The change in light points to a long forgotten disappearance. The shadow falls on what used to be a marshy shore. The Embarcadero runs across land constructed to support the growth of the city. Territorial expansion doesn't mean the extension of bearing capacity though. The bridge's westernmost cables must tie back to the bedrock of Rincon Hill 
blocks past the constructed shoreline. The last spans of the bridge hover above the soft ground between the seawall and the terra firma of old land. The shadow on the Embarcadero is a geological clue hidden on plain sight. And then you can see below, there's some teeny tiny text below the, the drawing that's not so teeny tiny in my book. So I'll just uh, read that out to you too. Um, the, the, um, the annotation identifies the components of the drawing, the span, which is a segment of a bridge or the distance over which a bridge or bridge segment extends. And then uh, on the ground shadow, uh, the absence of light registered on an opaque surface. So that's one answer to where the edge of the bay is. It's at Rincon Hill on, on solid ground where the bridge lands. But there's, there are other answers. And so another answer, which is at stop 30 on the walk, um, is along the Embarcadero. And uh, this is a drawing that shows things you can't see. Um, in some cases, because they're gone, like the Embarcadero Freeway, and in some cases, because they're hidden below the ground, like the layers of uh, gravel and rubble that were piled on top of bay mud and contained by a seawall in order to the extend the surface of the ground out into the deeper water of the bay. So um, I'll read you a little bit of this field entry also. San Francisco was born a port city. Goods and dollars flowed back and forth from water to land. Seamen lifted cargo into and out of ships. Stevedores and longshoremen moved it along wharves. Teamsters hauled it to and from warehouses. Clerks kept track of what came and went. Brokers matched freight to, to ships. Merchants and traders bought and sold raw materials and finished goods. Bankers held profits and covered losses. For San Francisco's first half century, there was no way to draw a line between the port and the city. When the seawall and piers were redesigned in late 19th and early 20th centuries, their construction included a continuous working boulevard along the wharves and warehouses. In 1909, it was named the Embarcadero, the landing place. So there are a couple of answers to the question, where is the edge of the bay here? One is at the seawall, and the other is to say that the edge is also a, a space of exchange where things come and go between land and water. Yeah, there's a wonderful also phrase thinking about the cars that are on the freeway and on the roadway and the ships that are coming in and out and not to mention the wildlife that's flowing in and out of the, of the bay. So it's each, each description is transitional in a way. It's about thinking about this in a very broad and almost uh, changing way. Exactly. And another thing that changes and that changes the answer about the edge of the bay is scale. So these are two drawings that talk about sc the scales we know in our everyday lives, the street, the bridge, the, 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 the seawall. Um, but there's another scale at which it's really important to think of the edge of the bay. And that is um, the scale of the watershed, the whole region of the Great Central Valley from which water comes into the, um, into the bay and through the Golden Gate into the Pacific Ocean. So this is a drawing that shows you something you can't see, not because it's hidden below ground, but because it brings together two things that are so far apart, the, the mountains of the Sierra Nevada and the bay that we don't perceive them simultaneously. And that's one wonderful thing that drawing can do. It can allow the, the juxtaposition and the combination of things um, that we don't perceive in our, ordinary, in our ordinary lives. And so here the annotation below the drawing is explaining what is a slope, uh, what is a river, what is sediment. And then I'll just read you a little bit of the field entry. The rivers and streams that run down the western slope of the Sierra Nevada are carrying the mountains to the bay. As mountains weather, their stony surfaces slowly disintegrate into small particles of mineral and soil. Flowing water has energy and streams moving down the Sierra steep hillsides gain enough momentum to pick up loose bits of land. 
As the streams merge into rivers, water carries the sediment through the Central Valley, the California Delta, and the Carquina Strait. Beyond the strait, the rivers spread out into San Francisco Bay. The water slows down. It loses energy, and the particles it holds fall to the bay floor. The process of erosion, the removal of land, becomes deposition, the accretion of land. Though it no longer flows in a straight line, water continues to move across the bay. Waves and tides lift the sediment that the rivers have deposited and put it back down in a new place. As they drift, these tiny pieces of cl land cloud the water. Turbidity is the measure of that cloudiness. Yeah, I really love this card in particular because as we uh, at the Exploratorium, we're partnering with the San Francisco port around thinking about the seawall and uh, the future of it in San Francisco Bay. And one of the topics that's discussed quite a bit is sediment, where we're going to get sediment to build the walls, to uh, restore the wetlands. We have had several talks in the past and it's and the people that are interested in sediment is, is a huge number of people in the Bay Area, yet for most of us, understanding how it moves and why it's so important to our future is something that this book really helps to understand where does it come from? Why do we need it? What can we use it for? It's, uh, it, it's really uh, a wonderful, wonderful way to think. And, and I also want to talk in the cards at the bottom on the, on the right side. I don't know if people noticed, but um, I call them cards because they're cards in the Bay Observatory. They're, it's actually a book of pages, but in our, in our use in the museum, uh, we, they're actually separate cards that you can pick up and look at. And, at the bottom of every, of every one of the field entries is a series of keywords. And can you talk a little bit about how the keywords in the field entries work together? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, but first I wanna say one more thing about erosion. Thank you, and sediment, because <laughs> I just, oh, I thought there's one more thing. I think what's important to remember um, and to think about in relation to that drawing and the keywords, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, is that the bay is not a, a thing. You know, the bay is not a fixed spot even. It, it's a series of phenomena and processes, um, some of them human, some of them more than human that are always changing and that are always dynamic. Um, and the keywords are a way of speaking to that uh, kind of um, um, ephemeral quality um, um, that quality of change over time that, that every landscape has. So the keywords are a way of classifying the field entries that doesn't have to do with where they are. The map puts them in relationship because one is next to the other or down the road from the other. The location, yeah. <laughs> they're fixed by location. That's right, they're, they're organized by location. But what became apparent uh, as I was working on the field entries was that these specific places and the questions they prompted really suggested another kind of classification, a kind of classification by theme. And those themes could be articulated in words that are really ordinary words, uh, words we use all the time, land, water, work, play, <laughs> defense, time. Um, biology, physics. Biology, biology. physics, <laughs> that's right. So, um, so the keywords were a way of putting different field entries into relation, not by their location, but by their, their content. And it's interesting how words we're used to using uh, in almost automatic ways turn out to be full of ambiguity and full of simultaneous and different and sometimes even contradictory meanings. And, you know, the three drawings and field entries I just showed you are in a way getting at the, the, the range of possible meanings of the words land and water, you know, they're, they're not fixed. And, and, and all of those drawings show how um, porous that boundary is between them, how, how artificial that boundary is between them. So there are some fancier keywords also, like the word infrastructure, which is another one that gets bandied about a lot. And 
we're, we're used to thinking about infrastructure, again, as a, a, a collection of, you know, very big things like the Bay Bridge or the seawall or a road. And the origins of the words infrastructure have to do with what's below the surface. Infrastructure really means the systems that support the things we, we, we recognize. So um, yes, there's physical infrastructure, but for instance, the infrastructure of the seawall is uh, underlaid by the infrastructure of the law because it was only legislation that made it possible for people to own land um, between the higher, drier ground of the hills and the deep water of the bay. So a law passed in 1851 said that these tide lands, these in-between wet and dry places could be bought and sold if they were raised above the level of the high tide, and that's where we get the seawall. So that's one kind of infrastructure. There's another infrastructure that has to do with people's practices, because if that seawall weren't maintained or all the retaining walls that make San Francisco uh, an inhabitable city in, instead of just a collection of very steep slopes, then the walls would crumble and, um, and be gone, and the, the landscape would return to some other uh, set of conditions, probably not exactly like what was before, but something that's not the thing we think is held in place by this very fixed object of the of the infrastructure. So there are there are a lot of possibilities. Um, uh, and it's for, important, I think. I mean, one one reason I think this is a kind of a learning moment in a way is that um, you know often in our work again trying to engage people in issues around sea level rise in the Bay Area. I mean, does this infrastructure hold the city in or does it keep the water out? It's, a, it's kind of a question that we grapple with, but it's also true that people who don't live near the water, for some reason, think that sea level rise won't affect them. And in fact, all of the infrastructure we depend upon, the roadways, that wall holds the sewer system, it holds the electricity, Without it, we can't really maintain our daily functions. And so it's a very important way to use Bay Lexicon to get people a little bit more familiar with how something like infrastructure is in a way kind of a commons. We all use it, we all need it, we depend upon it to live in contemporary life. So I love that, that way that it's, it's teased apart in the keywords in a way that just makes it um, much richer and deeper. Well, and I think what we also have to remember is that the objects people are used to calling infrastructure are actually the manifestation of values and decisions and choices. Um, and those values are subject to discussion and they're certainly subject to discussion uh, given the, the, um, the, the complexity and the, the transformation that we know is not even ahead of us. We, it's it's now. It's happening right now. Yeah. So maybe we should move on a little. I, I mean, the the we could go on and on about the keywords and and but it um, but it, they're complex and they really do have to. You really have to consider each site, and that brings me to the to our next thought, which is is really how can this be used not just in San Francisco? It occurs to me when I when I think about using this, I spent a bit of time in Boston you know, during the big dig. And they certainly needed some way to talk about the changes and the transformations that were happening there. So how do you see this as translating to other, other places? It's really a method more than a thing we can only use here. Yeah, that's a, such a great question. Thank you. That's such a generous question because the, the book was really intended always as a, as a case study uh, and as a way to test out um, methods of observing and understanding and talking about very complicated places. I mean, I think there's a problem in our culture that exists way beyond San Francisco, that the, the language we have inherited to talk about the world around us um, is not adequate to the, to the conditions that we're living in, where you can't really say, oh, you know, that's nature and that's culture, or that's land and that's water, or that's economy, that's ecology. So um, 
those kinds of in-betweens are, are everywhere. And until people have a way to talk about them, um, it'll be very hard to have any kind of informed or meaningful public discussion. So I think the things that are generalizable, the methods that are generalizable are the, um, the, the method of looking very carefully at what is in front of us and trying to figure out, you know, how did that get to be the way that it is? You know, it, it's in a way um, a kind of invitation to wonder about the circumstances we know now and, and their origins and their possible futures. And so that's one method that I think is, is useful pretty much every place. And then I think another method that's useful pretty much every place is to try to distill from those observations the kinds of themes that um, would let people organize what they see uh, into terms that, that they can um, use to argue for one point of view or another, for one ambition or another, for one value or another, for one method or, or another. Um, I think another thing that's important about the book that is also a translatable method is that um, to read it, a person really, I think, is will wind up going back and forth between the field entries. Let's say I'm on the walk, I'm at spot 11, I read about it, I look at the keywords, and then I see, oh, um, that might send me to spot, I have to think of a number, 27. Um, so there's a kind of recursive um, idea that, that it's important to, to always be going back and forth between what we can see and perceive, and then what we think about that and how we organize that in our minds and in our conversations. Mm -hmm. And as a tool, you've called it a tool for landscape literacy. And so I think you've described perfectly well how that could work. But I, I've also noticed that, you know, we work in the museum with, with, with youth, we work with scientists, we work with uh, people who work in agencies, we work with policymakers, and, and these tools are needed by everyone at all levels. I mean, the planners need to understand as well as, as local citizens who live near the waterfront, the changes that we're going to see going forward. And right now, San Francisco has so much development. We were talking about it earlier uh, along the waterfront. And are they using guide, guiding principles like these to be sure that uh, we understand exactly what we're building and why and how it'll fare in the future? Well, and whose principles? Because I think another thing I notice in, in, in the world uh, where I live and also in the world where you live is um, that often people have such particular points of view about the landscape and their own hopes for it, their own um, values around it, that they, they don't they, that they, they can't come together, you know, you see it from your point of view, I see it from mine, and um, expert one sees it in a certain narrow way through a certain technical lens, expert two sees it in another narrow way through a totally different technical lens. So there's not a vocabulary that allows people from different points of view at different levels of expertise uh, to talk to each other. And that's that's not only a sort of experts to citizens thing, because there's also a huge amount of um, knowledge that comes to people from their everyday lives in a place. And I think in most public fora that I, that I have seen, there aren't really good ways for that kind of information that from the practices of every, everyday life to work into expert conversations. So, you know, how do, how, how do we understand each other? The we who are citizens, the we who are, who are experts, um, the we who are plural in, in our concerns and, and our hopes. And also now I think, especially, you know, as the Bay Area gears up for sea level rise, there is much effort being placed and understand the ecology rather than just the different cities and the districts, but also really starting with community-based planning, starting exactly there. What do people know about the environments that they're living in? 
what do they see for their future and how do they want to organize their resources uh, with, with the city governments to, to, to kind of revitalize these areas and make them livable in the future. And there are big questions. Some of them may not be livable in the future, quite honestly. <laughs> so it's uh, having right. a tool that allows you to talk about what's possible or not. Is, well, Definitely. and even to perceive what's out there, you know, I um, I grew up with such a beautiful story. I think it's not not exactly true, but I'll tell it anyway. For maybe other people know it that uh, the Inuit had said twenty seven words for snow, and the range and nuance of that vocabulary allowed them to see differences that that the rest of us missed. And um, I think it's it's such a powerful story at a moment when we're bombarded by information about environmental crisis. And, and yet so many people don't have the, uh, the vocabulary that would allow them to actually see and perceive and register and observe what's, what's around them, you know, to, to, to know that um, the winding route of Alamany uh, Boulevard in San Francisco looks that way because it follows the, the, the bed of a river that's actually still buried underground. And that's just waiting to come to the surface again uh, when the rains are too big for the, for the storm drain to contain. So it's, I think it's, it's so important that we, that we have language, whether it's the language of images or the language of words, that lets us identify what's out there. Like, for instance, you know, Peterson's first guide to the birds is able to give people a general impression of shape and size that lets them say, okay, I recognize that. I recognize that 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 creature. I recognize that that combination of things. Yeah. So one thing might be interesting is to talk a moment about the origins of this project. Um, as I said, Jane, well, she was an artist in residence at the Exploratorium in I think 2007. And then we, uh, the foundation of this book kind of started, but we weren't really focusing so much exactly on the waterfront. It was just really landscape. How do you understand landscape? Then we were able to, uh, then we got keys to piers 15 and 17 and the museum was headed to uh, move down, uh, down to the waterfront from our former location. And Jane came and kind of sat in the office and we always, uh, when a new artist in residence come in, we always give them this paper written by our founding director called Rationale for Science Museum, which is the founding principles of the Exploratorium. If, People, please check that link out if you don't know who we are, but we, uh, we're kind of known for hands-on learning, for doing some interactive building exhibits on site about the fundamentals of nature and giving people an opportunity to learn at their own rate how they uh, see the world and, and put those pieces together. So we give Jane this paper and uh, tell, tell them your observations of reading. This well, it was just amazing. From 1969. <laughs> it was from 1969, but it seemed so relevant. I mean, one thing that um, for me was very powerful about Frank Oppenheimer's writing was his position that um, there that there was a big gap between the increasing power of science and technology to shape society and the ability of you know, ordinary people to understand those, um, those those phenomena and processes. And so this essay was about the need for a museum that would create tools for the immediate perception of scientific and, and technological phenomena. And as I was reading it, I thought, well, if we took the phrase science and technology and replaced it with environment, it would be exactly apt to that moment and maybe even more apt to this moment that, um, that there's a big gap between what's happening all around us um, at, at, at the scale of landscapes and, and, and bigger and bigger, the scale of the whole world in the Anthropocene and the ability of you know, a person on the street to, to know exactly why that's happening and what it means. So, um, 
so that that was really powerful for me and and I, I was thinking yeah language and the tool for perception and the many words for snow and da, 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 da. and then this is not I don't know if you remember we we've came upon information about Patrick Geddes's observatory in Edinburgh. This was like the kind of missing link. And we said, okay, maybe we can make an observatory. Oh, um, yeah. That's right. And then we we thought, well, I kind of started to think, well, it's going to be a long time until there's a gallery and a beautiful place like the one that you were able to make. Um, what's the lowest common denominator? And it seemed like there were two things. And now I'm going to share my screen again. I'll show you a little bitty drawing. Oops, host disabled participant screen sharing. Here, can you make me the host again? Yep. I'm the host now. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. And it was also interesting, the Exploratorium, you know, is a museum that has probably at any time on its floor 600 exhibits, and they're all about nature, but not exactly the environment. <laughs> so, know, which is, yeah, I, they're just the kind of, the, the, it's, it, they're about, they're they're about nature as it's understood in a laboratory not nature as it's understood in the laboratory of the world all around us so okay so this is the very first drawing that 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 um began bay lexicon because there was this conversation what's the lowest common denominator for an observatory and there was it seemed like it would be a window so you could have a look at what was out there and then a dictionary that would give you the language to be able to perceive and observe and contemplate and reimagine what you saw. And the window, it turned out we had in the old um, peer buildings at Pier 15 and Pier 17. And the dictionary, I thought, well, that's something we can make. And that was the origin of Bay Lexicon. So it started out um, with a, a um, a very small study of these two very basic words, land and water. And then it went on to, I guess, collect other words and, and other places. And so this was another early drawing I made just sitting on the, the uh, I think it's Pier 9 where people fish and thinking what's out there? You know, what, what can I see? What are the words I know that could describe those places? Um, and uh, how could those words begin to be pictured in drawings and how could the drawings begin to be annotated in a way that help people um, have the, the tools they needed to recognize what they were looking at. So from there, <laughs> the exhibit, oh, and I could show a picture of the installation yeah. Should I do that, Susan? Yeah, yeah maybe. Okay, just. let's share one more time. So anyway, so we thought, okay, instead of a dictionary that's a book, let's make a collection of flash flashcards that you could walk around with. This is what Susan is talking about when she says cards. And the so the cards, you know, could you could you the idea was you could take them with you. They lived in, they still live in a very heavy cart. Um, that in principle is able to leave the gallery, but in fact, I think it's only when Susan and I put all of our weight behind it that it goes anywhere. <laughs> so um, you could look at what was out there, look at the drawing, and then turn the drawing over and and read a little bit about it. And the um, and and the thing was that it and here's where we get to the book. It always seemed like. Um, that was a wonderful beginning, but it wasn't the whole story because it didn't really allow the explication of all the connections, all the web of relationships among the, the, the phenomena that, um, that were in those drawings. And also, like I said, it was really heavy. <laughs> so, um, so, that's the, so that's where the idea of the field guide came um, and, and the idea it's, that it's something that you use, you know, and you bring with you sit down yeah. and read. I mean, a dictionary yeah. is interesting because it's a browsing type of experience. You don't pick it up and read it from the beginning to end. You kind of use it as you need it and add to it as you need it. And, you know, I and I, I, I like that sense that we were making something that would be used. It's experiential. It's not you know, the, uh, it's not the Bible of the landscape. It's a way to think yeah. about it. 
it's not the Bible, it's an invitation. And here is where I want to say um, um, thank you, thank you to my wonderful acquisitions editor at MQUP, because when he came to talk to me about the project, um, the very first time, I, I thought he was going to say, oh, you can call my friend at some other press, but instead he said, well, I think we would want to make it, you know, a paperback so it wasn't too heavy and about this size so that you could take it with you. Um, and, and, and there we are. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can take it with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one, one other question I have, you know, when I first met Jane, um, she was teaching at UC Berkeley, I think, and uh, you were working in a landscape architecture office uh, with a very good friend of ours. And that's how we met first. And, um, and yet, when I think of your work, it's, it's more scholarly than you're a designer, but you're not building landscapes, you're not building places, you're informing all of your work is about place and you work with students, but um, I sort of want to talk about the role of design in really thinking about some of these climate change questions um, and, and what roles can designers take um, besides designing, because there's so much work to be done. And, and really, that's what everybody's doing is trying to remake the shoreline, trying to think about new plazas, trying to think about heat islands. Um, talk about a little your, your work as a designer. Yeah, well, I think, you know, site design is really important. It, it's hugely important. And excellent des site design is something I, I respect and admire. And at the same time, um, for better or worse, the landscapes that most people know are not shaped by design and designers. They are shaped by politics and economics um, and the aggregated decisions of many, many, many people, whether it's at the ballot box or, or in the marketplace. And so um, it seems to me like design needs to operate at different scales and in different ways. I mean, in medicine, there's clinical medicine, which works one patient at a time and does noble and important things. And then there's also the field of public health, which looks at scales of populations and thinks about um, how to um, measure and manage very large scale uh, phenomena and tendencies. And so it seemed to me like that was a pretty interesting model for design that it was possible for someone like me um, who had a lot of training in the reading of landscapes uh, and the documentation of landscapes um, could maybe usefully offer the design of uh, information in a way that was able to frame a conversation that 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 just wasn't happening um, where I was then, which was in, in San Francisco and in, in Northern California. So um, so I guess that that's how I got here. I mean, I think that the that the question arises: well, what what is it that we think we're designing anyway? <laughs> and uh, and and I think that's what I thought for me. Um, yeah, that's what I would like to try to design. And also, I think from our perspective at the Exploratorium, I mean, the uh, we've had a long standing, one of the first programs was an artist in residence program, this understanding that creative people can really contribute to knowledge in really important ways. And the book, the way the, the visual qualities of the drawing and it, it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful way to, to use visuality to complement the world around you and to work with it and understand it better. So I, I really appreciate that role of the arts and science together to help us you know, bridge these gaps, think about the future. So I see we have a few questions. Um, you know, uh, someone's asking about the Anthropocene. And uh -huh. <laughs> you mean like, what is it? The question, um, I think he's, sure. th this question is, is asking about how you see your work reflecting this place we're in right now in history? Yeah, that's a really great question because people and more than human um, uh, forces have been in a dynamic interaction 
you know, forever. I, th I think probably since there, since there have been people. Uh, so what I think is important about the Anthropocene is that it's, it's not that there, that some degree of um, mixing up between people and not people is happening. It's the scale of the transformation. So, um, you know, um, the Dutch uh, physicist, uh, uh, Paul Crutzen um, coined the term Anthropocene to talk about the moment at which um, human impacts on the climate became um, completely and unambiguously uh, visible. But I think in addition to that, um, there are so many places and ways in which we can measure human impact and see human impact. There's, there's no place left that hasn't been profoundly transformed by cultural decisions. I mean, even places that have big fences around them and are allowed to just exist without people are, are products of a cultural decision. So I think, you know, in English, we, we, we tend to separate what's human from what's not human. You know, we, we, we have these terms like nature and culture. And I think they're just not very helpful uh, at the moment because they don't tell us how to understand um, what happens when, you know, the tree root cracks the sidewalk. We, 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 don't, we don't really have a kind of word for that or when water undermines a retaining wall. You know, we, we say, oh, it's an engineering failure, or oh, it's a natural disaster, but actually it's, it's neither of the, those things, or maybe it's both of those things. Yeah, and another question is about your historical research methods and ethnographic and or anthropological methods contributed to the development of Bay Lexicon. Uh, can you discuss how you used historical uh, research and and because because I, I you know I, a lot of the book got written when you weren't here you know in San Francisco so I was I was even surprised at how much you were able to glean from some of the contemporary sources that are out there right now <laughs> well I have the great good fortune to work at uh, a university with a giant reference library <laughs> <laughs> and and I've made a lot of use of it and I, I think you know there's there's so much out there, I, I mean, what I guess I would say is I did a lot of work in the field. I mean, I think about walking as a kind of uh, thinking really. And um, I did a lot of talking to people um, along the shoreline or with expertise um, I, um, about the Bay. Um, and then, uh, I don't know. I mean, I used a lot of digital archives. There's amazing stuff online I found. Uh, old maps, um, sometimes online and sometimes through our map and data library at the University of Toronto. Um, yeah, you just dig. <laughs> I guess, I, I don't know, I just, I can't say I really had a method. I, I just, uh, <laughs> I yeah. just, I just did it. I guess that's, <laughs> I probably shouldn't confess that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and another question from another uh, uh, sea level rise, uh, Christina Gerhardt, uh, I think, thank you for coming, is asking about Delta Primer and how yeah. you moved from that to how, how that influenced Bay Lexicon. Wow, um, that's a great question. I guess what I'll say for people who, who don't know Delta Primer um, is that it was a book and a deck of cards that described Describe the very complicated and very uh, hotly contested landscape of the, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, the California Delta. Um, and that um, tried to provide a slightly different set of tools for, for discussion and negotiation. Um, I think, You know, that, that think, project think, made me think a lot about maps and stories and drawings and how, um, how you could use drawing and, uh, and uh, narrative drawing in particular to make the point that a map is not a neutral, flat, um, objective description of the world, that, that we, we actually have to think about, um, about um, the description of, of places in a way that's much more dynamic, that's much more about um, 
people's experience, people's values, the phenomena that people don't control, but that are dynamic. I think it, it was a kind of, uh, it, was a, it was an attempt to leave Flatland. And I think that um, Bay Lexicon is another way of thinking about those questions that, 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 I, that I wouldn't have arrived at first. Well, I think they're both exploring too these, you know, the idea of the, the questions about the Delta on, on a deck of cards. The yeah, like what are method, what are media? Okay, so here's another thing. Okay, now I, now I have a better answer. <laughs> what I, the one thing I think about both of those projects is it's kind of like um, when the dog has to take medicine and you put the pill in a big glob of peanut butter and then boom, it's down the hatch because it, it's, you know, the world is a complicated and difficult place. And I think to say to people, oh, you have to learn about the environment and the catastrophe and the this and the that, and think about your own role in it because you know, you're part of the problem and you own it too. Like that's, that, that's just terrible. You know, it just makes people just feel bad. And um, so I guess one other thing in common about these two projects is that in their different ways, they're an attempt to make something that's, um, that's beautiful and that's that's fun and that's playful uh, as a way to help people um, take on information that's hard and 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 challenging and that asks them to think for themselves, you know, what their own role is in a very big set of of dilemmas. Mm -hmm. And another question here is: Could this be applied beyond uh, something like Bay Lexicon? Could it be? applied to other types of landscapes, not shorelines, but- Yep, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because somewhere else. <laughs> every place is complicated. <laughs> and I don't know a single place where there aren't um, many different possibilities and where there doesn't need to be some kind of conversation about who gets what, you know? And, and who could be the fish or who could be the water or who could be one group of people or another group of people. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the more we can think of ourselves as landscape detectives who are just trying to understand what's there and trying to tell ourselves and each other in a clear way about what's there and what we think might be next, uh, the, the better for all kinds of places. Yeah, so anyway, uh, one last question is kind of to me, I guess, which is how, how do I, uh, could I, could I talk more about how I combine art design and science and how I do it is I find people like Jane. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I do it. And uh, so anyway, thank you all so much. I think we're, I'm going to ask Peter back where uh, I see we're at, we're at about a minute left. I know Jane wanted to thank a few people and, and I did too about the, 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 this, this project. So um, maybe we'll do that. And then Peter, take over and uh, uh, tell us what to do next. <laughs> so Susan, shall I thank first or shall you yeah, thank? No, you go. You I'll go. thank first. Okay. Well, um, thanks to Peter and thanks to City Lights. Uh, it's been so fun. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, and I wanted to say especially thanks to everybody at McGill, McGill Queens University Press. It just has been such a pleasure to work with you all. And I'm so thrilled with, with the book and with all that you have done to take a bunch of typewritten pages and, um, and, 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 and uh, kind of stuck in drawings and turn it into something really amazing. And I think also my very biggest thanks is to Susan for um, not only this conversation, but so, so, so many years of, of walking and talking and thinking and, uh, and laughing. <laughs> yeah, well, same here. Thanks. Thanks to you and this wonderful friendship and all the things we've done and all the other people here I see I know who've contributed in different ways to this project. Um, but I also want to thank the funders. Uh, we had some seed money from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the Warhol Foundation, and also uh, the first money to really start thinking about the book was from the Seed Fund, the San Francisco Seed Fund. So they gave us a couple grants. So thank you to all of you for your help. And again, to City Lights, this is so much fun. 
and we're just down the street from each other. We're neighbors, so we I do this more often. <laughs> I know it's about time. Um, <laughs> this has been such a rich conversation, and and so much to think about. I mean, when you think about you know the water rising, you know, along our shores, the fact that we're in this heavy seismic zone, and it's just given us so much to consider and meditate on. And and really, thank you, Jane Wolf, for this wonderful book. Susan, thank you. You make an excellent interviewer. I also want to thank Jackie and Linda, our friends over at McGill Queens University Press for you know everything they're doing. And of course, the Exploratorium for co-sponsoring tonight's event. I have posted links. Please check out their calendar. Check out what's going on over there. Very, very exciting stuff. And thanks, last but not least, to all of you in the audience for joining us and helping complete the circle.